Second Timothy here is another epistle of the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Timothy was a was a a pastor, you know, the, the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus are often referred to as pastoral epistles. They're giving a lot of um, instruction on how the church ought to be run and for these young pastors on, on everything they need to do. And here in chapter number four, we see the Apostle Paul is saying, I charge thee therefore, in verse number one, he's giving him charges and this is what you need to do. Verse two, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. These are all things. He's saying, Timothy, you need to be doing these things. You need to be reproving. You need to be rebuking. And you need to be exhorting. And you need to be using long suffering and doctrine. And he says here in verse number three, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. He's saying, this is why you need to be reproving, rebuking, using long suffering, using doctrine. You need to be exhorting. You need to be doing these things because the time is coming. In the future, when people, they're not going to want to hear the truth. They're going to be turned unto fables. They're going to be turned unto just whatever suits their fancy, just to whatever they, that feels good unto them, sounds good unto them, regardless of whether it's true or not. They're not going to care about the truth, which is all the more reason why you, Timothy, need to be preaching and teaching what is right. Verse 4 says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. And this is, this is a commandment that, you know, regardless of what they're doing, you need to make sure you're doing the work of God. These are your charges. He says, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And what we're going to be focusing more on is that, is that charge there of doing the work of an evangelist and making full proof of thy ministry. Now, the subject matter I'm going to be preaching on this morning is what's known as lifestyle evangelism. Who has heard of this, this before? You've heard of this phrase before. Okay. Yeah, some, some of you have heard about this before. Basically, okay, my synopsis of lifestyle evangelism is, you know, maybe someone someday will see how happy you are and how joyful you are and how great it is to be a Christian. This is the philosophy, right? That you're living this great, super happy Christian life and maybe someone's going to look at that. Maybe you have a great marriage and they're going to say, wow, I just want to know what that person has. What is it that's making your life so special and so great when I just feel sad and depressed or whatever, you know, and what's the secret? And then they're going to come and they're going to ask you about it. And that right there then will be your perfect opportunity to give them the gospel. Okay, and that's, that's essentially kind of what this lifestyle evangelism is. And it goes further than that. They basically tell you, you know, to make friendships with people. Make friends with just, just a bunch of lost people that's out in the world. Just start, make, you know, become buddy-buddy with them. Go out, play golf, invite them over for dinner, you know, and just start hanging out and get to know them real well and establish a relationship with them. Because it may take a while before you are finally able to talk to that person where they can trust you to talk about religion. And that's the a whole style of evangelism. Now, evangelism is when you, when you preach the gospel. Right? I mean, that's what evangelism is. That's what evangelist is supposed to do. If you're an evangelist, you're in charge of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what evangelist is supposed to do. And a pastor has that job as well, as we all do. Now, there's certain people who make evangelism their entire life's duty, where they just go out and there's always preaching the gospel. And they, you know, they actually get paid to do that. They're a servant of Christ. You know, and the church sends them out. You could send out evangelists to where they're just full-time soul winning full-time going out and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And amen, praise the Lord for that. But so when we see terms here about being like an evangelist or someone who's an evangelist, that's typically more what it's referring to than just everybody's responsibility to preach the gospel. But this lifestyle evangelism is a joke. I actually, I, I went online <clears throat> just because I, I wanted to get a, a, a source for a, what they believe or what they teach, right? Because I wasn't brought up with this, even though I've heard about it. This isn't something that I've experienced firsthand, you know, in any of the churches that I've been to. But it's very prevalent today, and a lot of people are using this as an excuse to not go soul winning, and they're, and they're claiming that this is the way to go. And I'm going to teach you all about this fraud of a lifestyle evangelism. Now, 
Um, I'm going to be reading from you. I've done this in the past a couple times from this article I found. I think it was on like Christianity Today or something like that. And this guy, it's Mark Lauterbach. He was, he was the pastor of First Baptist Church in Los Altos, California. So I'm not even talking about like, you know, some, you know, Protestant denomination that's doing this stuff because whatever, they're going to be mixed in all kinds of false stuff because there's some, I mean, unsaved. This is a Baptist church. So this, is, this has gotten into many Baptist churches, which is one of the reasons why I'm bringing it up today. Now, this, this is from 1998, but it's still the same mentality. I mean, it's still the same teaching. It says here, I'm going to read for you now. This is this, is this guy, uh, Mark Lauterbach, um, um, writing. You know, this is his, his, uh, his words. It says, 11 years ago when I became a senior pastor which would imply that he was an associate pastor or some other type of pastor prior to that when he became a senior pastor, because that's the way these churches work. They're big churches. You have these associate pastors, assistant pastors, and then the, the, the lead pastor or senior pastor who's like the guy that's supposed to be in charge. But um, he says, 11 years ago when I became senior pastor. Now, this is a, he's been a senior pastor for 11 years to this point. But he, now he's, he's going back. He says, 11 years ago when I became a senior pastor, I, became, I, was, I puzzled over how to encourage people to share their faith. This was, this was something that he's just like puzzled. Oh man, how, how am I going to get people to share their faith? How, how do I do it? Lead pastor of the church going, huh, how can I tell people to share their faith? I believed in lifestyle evangelism and wanted to be an example to the congregation, which tells you, he, wasn't, he believed in lifestyle evangelism, but he wasn't practicing lifestyle evangelism, which is what he said he believed in. Because if he doesn't even know how to explain it to his congregation, he's like, well, I want to be an example to them. If you want to be an example, you've got to be an example by doing. Which, again, he's implying here he wasn't doing lifestyle evangelism, even though he, he claims to have believed in it. But anyways, I mean, you know, this isn't all just a rip on this one guy, because there's many guys out there like that. It, it's the mindset. And this is the same mindset against many of these people. He says, I just didn't do it. So right there, he says, I didn't do it. Senior pastor of a church. Not even doing what he says he believes in. He says, I didn't know any non-Christians. I highly doubt that. My whole world was the church. I worked with Christians, socialized with Christians, and worshipped with Christians all of my evangelism was official. Preaching, funerals, walk-in counseling. I wondered what sort of evangelist I would be without all the official opportunities. If I were not a pastor, would I be any good at doing what I told my, fo my flock to do? So again, this is a perfect example of a Pharisee. Because he says and he does not. He's, he's admitting right here, I was telling my flock, I was telling my people to do this stuff, and I wasn't doing it all myself. And I was puzzling, how could I even tell the people what to do? And this is why so many people are getting turned away from churches. Because you hear a man stand up, the senior pastor, saying, you need to go out and do this and you need to do that. And he's not even lifting a finger. Not doing it at all. But notice what he says here. He says all of his evangelism, all of his evangelism, he calls it official. Um, from, from official things. Preaching, so like preaching behind the pulpit, how is that your evangelism? I mean, what does that mean? You're preaching the gospel every week just from behind the pulpit? Church isn't here for, for people. Our church service this morning, it's not here so you can all get saved. Because guess what? Everyone that's here this morning is saved or is a young child and hasn't gotten saved yet. So that is not the point of a church service. I'm not using this time right now to be evangelistic and getting the gospel out to you. That is, that is not the purpose of what we're doing right now. So that's one of his official ways that he was, used, he was um, evangelizing. Funerals, okay, amen, that's a good place to do evangelism. That is, I, I'll agree with that. And he says, walk in counseling. Okay, you could do evangelism that way too. But see, you're going to find out that even evangelism in this guy's you know, definition is going to be not what we think it is. His, his, they're weak watered down approach to even trying to give somebody the gospel is uh is is just it's just a fraud but um so those were his that was all of his evangelism 
Now, how often, I mean, unless they've got this huge church of people just dying left and right, I mean, you're not up at funerals all the time preaching the gospel. And again, with the walk-in counseling, I don't know what these people's schedules are like. But, I mean, I don't know how much time you set apart in the, every day to do counseling. I mean, if you, even if you did counseling every single day, I mean, what are you going to set aside, an hour or two? I mean, and that was the extent of all of his evangelism. So, and then he's just like, well, if I wasn't a pastor, I wasn't doing this, I don't know what I'd be doing. How, how could I even be an evangelism, evangelist? And we saw here in, first, in 2 Timothy 4, the pastor's job is to do the work of an evangelist. That is something that the pastor has to do because they are to be an example to the flock. In that, he had that right. He's like, I need to be an example to these people. Yeah, you do need to be an example. You need to do the work of an example. I'm going to keep reading. Here's another quote in his, in his article. He says, I asked God to teach me to be a fisher of men. Since then, God has given me some wonderful and painful pointers. Now, again, all I could say is, this is a great attitude or desire to want to be a fisher of men. But he's the pastor. He's the lead pastor. And what that tells me is that he is not following Christ. If he, still, if he wants to be a fisher of men and he's not a fisher of men, he's not following Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ said unto them, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If you're following Christ, if you're truly following him, he will make you a fisher of men. If you're not a fisher of men, you're not following Christ. It's as simple as that. And then we have a guy here admitting again, saying, look, I want to be a fisher of men. You're the lead pastor. You ought not to be a lead pastor if you're any pastor, if you're not a fisher of men. Continuing on here in his, little, in his article, he says, I'd always assumed that unchurched people would not want to be friends with a pastor. My role would make people feel awkward. They would cuss when they hit a bad golf shot, turn blush, and apologize to me. Or at a birthday party, make comments about having fun after I left. To my surprise, I found non-religious people remarkably open. Even, I mean, do, you know, do you sense the pharisaical attitude here? My you know, unchurched people and the non-religious people you know, making you know, remarks on, on having fun after I left. And, you know, this, this arrogance, the attitude. To my surprise, I found non-religious people remarkably open, even hungry for friendship. So, like, as if it's just like, uh, like, like a, a laboratory, like, oh, here's, here's a non-religious person. What, what do you think? Do you think they want friends? No, no, they wouldn't want friends. I mean, only church people want friends, right? These are non-religious people. They would never want a friend. In the world... They were hungry for friendship. Well, yeah, it's called being a human being. People like to have friends. Right. Some were curious about, God, about who God is and welcomed my presence. Others were lonely. They had no community. My first, listen to this. My first step in telling people about Jesus was to look for people who liked me. Does that sound like biblical truth to you? Does Jesus say, you know what? I want you to preach the gospel to every creature. Here's the first step. Find someone that likes you. Find someone that already likes who you are and what you do. I mean, if I were to go out and try to find people that liked me, or what about like Pastor Anderson or Pastor Jimenez? Pastor Jimenez, if he had to just go and find someone that liked him in Sacramento before he could even try to preach the gospel unto them, how many people do you think he's going to be getting saved? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Romans 10.20 says, But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. See, the boldness is I was bold. I went and sought out the people. They weren't looking for me. They weren't, they weren't coming to me and saying, hey, I want to get saved. What must I do to be saved? He says, I'm going to them. I'm preaching the gospel to them. And that is the call that we are supposed to do. The first step in preaching the gospel is not find people that like you. Because first of all, if you're going to find people that like you, you're not going to be talking about Jesus at all. You're just going to be saying, hey, these are my, these are my hobbies. This is what I like to do. And for him, it's this golf and, and food or whatever. Like, this is, this is so backwards when it comes to evangelizing. I'm going to keep reading here. 
it just it, it boggles my mind how how ridiculous this this is. But this, look, look, my friends, this is the the mindset that many people have today, and I I hope you never get and stay away from the churches that teach this type of thing. And let me just state this right now: preaching the gospel to friends and people you have a relationship. Amen. That's great. And you know what? Maybe there are some people that won't respond well to someone coming to their door and preaching the gospel to them. Okay? And maybe there are some people that the best way to reach them is going to be through being a relative or being a, a, a friend from, you know, like someone that they're comfortable with. But that doesn't mean that you do things this way. We still need to make sure that we do things the Bible way. And like I said, you, you're going to preach the gospel to your family and friends anyways. Of course you're going to do that. So you're going to make use of all the relationships you have as it is. But the point of evangelizing is not to go out and just seek friendships with the world in order to preach the gospel unto them. He says, I made friends through common interests. We met parents of our kids' school friends. I would think you'd make the parents of your kids' friends regardless of trying to win them to Christ. I mean, just, the whole mindset is here is, well, well I, see, I need to find friends, some, you know, people who are unchurched, they're not religious. So your kids are hanging out with non-religious, you know, whatever. Right? This is, it, it's, it's ridiculous. I'm not even going to go into all that. So he says, we met parents of our kids' school friends. I coached sports teams. These were the same opportunities my church people had. So now he's trying to be that common man, right? And um, doing common interests. None, it's funny, none of his common interests are, uh, I don't know, regardless. Let's keep going. I'm going to keep reading here. He says, when we purchased our home, I got to know the real estate agent. Hey, that's good. He had books all over his office and said he loved to read. He also told funny jokes, though most were a little off color. So always saying here, these, his jokes are funny, but they're, but they're off color. If they're off color, they shouldn't be funny. And he says most, not some or a few. He said like every once in a while he threw an off color joke. No, most of them. I mean, this guy's telling dirty jokes. He says, we had a lot of fun in the process of closing the deal, and I decided this friendly contact could go beyond a business relationship. Even though he made it clear religion was not his thing, I pursued the friendship. We had some lunches together. We played golf. I found a man who appreciated other people, including me. He would say I was his token pagan friend. It's a pastor of a church. Has a, has a token pagan friend. And he calls them a friend. I mean, they're, they're out, they're hanging out, they're doing things together. And um, you know what the Bible says, now let's get, let's get back to some scripture. Turn if you go to James chapter 4. If you're in uh, 2 Timothy, just go forward in your Bible past Hebrews to James chapter 4. Now, I'm going to get into this a little bit later in the sermon, but the Bible is very clear about how our relationships should be with people in the world. We don't shun the world. So don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying you just don't have anything ever to do with people who are unsaved because that is not right. But what you also don't do is go and make best buddies with, with the world either. There's lots of admonitions on, on who your friends are and who you spend time with about them rubbing off on you and, and bringing you down instead of you, you know, thinking you're going to be doing so much for them. The Bible says in James 4, verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So being friends with this world in general, being friends with the world, the things that the world produces, the things that the world puts out, and then I would include people that are just of the world, just completely of the world, and you're making good, strong, solid like friendships with them, and you're hanging out, and you're doing all this stuff together, and you're spending a bunch of time with them, and never preaching them the gospel because he didn't. What he's doing is he's going out with this guy, they're playing golf, they're going out to eat, he's saying... He's calling him, hey, you're my token pagan, I'm your token pagan friend. 
He said, I'm a pagan. Ha ha. You're a pastor. You're laughing at my dirty jokes and I'm your friend. And that's, I mean, he's mocking the guy. He doesn't even realize it. He's, I'm your token pagan friend. He goes on here. He says, sometimes he pushed the boundaries. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Sometimes he pushed the boundaries. One night he told a hilarious story. So not just mildly. I mean, he says, this is a hilarious story, though slightly off color. Now, again, he's, using, he's trying to, to really downplay the off-color. He already mentioned that he makes you know, off-color jokes. Hilarious story, though slightly off-color. I laughed. His wife said, I didn't think you'd laugh at that. He wanted to test you. Now, if you're testing someone, do you think it's slightly off-color? I mean, just, just a little bit. After he's already been laugh laughing at your off-color jokes for the past year, He says, it was hilarious, though slightly off cover. I didn't think you'd laugh at that. He wanted to test you. I told them I did not tell dirty jokes. So now he's calling it dirty. Now it goes from slightly off color to, well, I don't tell dirty jokes. So which is it? Is it slightly off color or is it dirty? I'm going with dirty. Otherwise, he wouldn't even be talking about it. I did not tell dirty jokes, but still thought some were funny. Well, shame on you then. You ought, we ought to have a hatred for sin. We ought not to, to, to warm up and say, ha, 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 yeah, that's funny, and make a mock at sin. I just preached about this in the Proverbs sermon. Making a mock. Fools make a mock at sin. And here you are laughing at dirty jokes. It led to an interesting conversation. Ephesians 5, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. This pastor, whatever your name is, uh, Lauterbach, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become as saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Is you think that's acceptable unto the Lord for you to just be laughing at a bunch of dirty jokes that some worldly guy is just telling you? Is that acceptable unto God? Is that pleasing unto God? Ah, ha, 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 yeah, that's funny. And, and not only is he laughing like outwardly, he thinks it's hilarious. He thinks it's funny. He's not saying, I told him it was hilarious. He, he says in, just, in his narration, this hilarious story. Oh man, it was super funny. But it was dirty. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. This guy is a total joke. Unfortunately, this is where leadership in so many so-called Christian churches are today. Now, I want to talk real quickly, though, about this. Turn back, if you would, to Matthew chapter 9. This concept of, because where they, where they get this from, where they get this idea from is they say, oh, well, you know, Jesus was friends with sinners and he was always being ridiculed for, by that from the Pharisees. And they'll say, see, you're a Pharisee because you're saying you shouldn't be, you know, friends with sinners, but Jesus was friends with sinners. Now, we're going to look at this, first of all, and see what the Bible actually says about Jesus being friends with sinners. Because it's something that gets spoken, but it's not accurate at all. Matthew chapter 9, look at verse number 10. We're going to see exactly what Jesus did versus what was said about him. Because they're two different things. Matthew 9 verse 10 says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, 
Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. So here is Jesus is. He's sitting down and he's eating, right? He's having lunch or whatever. A bunch of publicans and sinners come and they find, hey, they pull up a chair and they sit with him. Okay, no big deal. Now, would you say that these are just his friends or these people that just came and, and sat down and ate with him? Well, we'll see. We're going to keep reading. It says, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And keep this in mind. I'm going to go over this in just a minute. When, when these people sat down with him, he likened himself to a physician. Okay, let's, let's turn now to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, just a couple pages over. Matthew 11, verse 18. Matthew 11, verse 18. The Bible reads, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath the devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they, and they say... Right, he's talking about other people talking about him. And they say, just like they said about John, he had the devil, they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber. Was that true about Jesus? Was Jesus gluttonous or a wine-bibber? No. But were people saying that about him? Yes. But they say a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Now, did Jesus sit and eat with publicans and sinners? Yes. But does that mean he was friends with them? No, he came eating and drinking, but they called, they went to the extreme and said, oh man, you're, you're, you're gluttonous, you're a wine bibber, you're friends with these sinners. The Bible never says that he was friends with the sinners. It says, well, look, turn if you would to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. You can be friendly towards people without being their friends. You could treat people in a nice way, in a loving way, in a caring way, without just being buddies with them, being good friends with that person. Because right. this is a big difference. We need to understand that. We're not to just go out into the world and just start making friends with a bunch of lost people. We're supposed to be, you know, friends edify each other. You're, you're there for each other. And, you know, when you don't have, and oftentimes friends do come from common interests. Your common interests ought to be common interests of serving God, going to church, you know, doing the things in the work of God. You're not going to find that out in the world. Mm -hmm. Normally, what you're going to find is friends that you have after you get saved and, and older friends and longtime friends you have. You know what's going to end up happening? Either they're going to get saved because you're going to be talking about it or you're going to end up parting ways because they're not going to want to hear it. And that's, what, that's reality. And that's if you're living a righteous, godly life, that's probably what, that's what's going to happen. Luke chapter 15, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Jesus was preaching, and they come to hear his preaching. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, this is great for soul winning, great soul winning passage. Amen and amen. But what was he doing? Was he just friends with these people? Or were these people coming and hearing his preaching and sat down to eat with him and sat down to listen to him? See, that's what's going on here. He's not, he's not going over and hanging out with them at the bar. He's not going over there and spending time with them and going golfing with them. Jesus is doing the work of his Father. 
He's going around and preaching. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's doing all these things. All, he had so much work to do, and he's praying for hours on a mountaintop. How much time do you think he has to go and just spend and, and go, golf, go golf 18 holes with, with some random guy? Do you think that's what he was doing ever? Wasn't happening. Now, sharing a meal with sinners that came to hear Jesus preach is way different than becoming close friends with those people. Jesus likened himself to a physician, as we saw earlier in Matthew chapter 9. He's saying, hey, these people came, and when, and when the Pharisees are, are, are getting all upset about it, he says, look, you know, they that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. The physician heals the sick. He doesn't just let them continue in their condition, and, but just become friends with them and hope that one day they're going to ask him for a cure. I mean, imagine this. If you're a doctor, or you go to a doctor, you're sick, right? You've got a condition. You're saying, man, I need to heal this problem that I have because I don't know what to do about it. And you go to a doctor, and the doctor says, hey, what are you doing next week? You want to come over? Yeah, we'll get the, we'll get the families together. We'll spend some time together. Never says anything about your problem, any of your disease. Just come on over. We'll get to know you. And just continually, just for years and years, and, and you're just sick and dying, and you're getting worse and worse and worse. Is that a good doctor? That's just letting you continue on in that condition without even saying, hey, if you want to get better, this is what you got to do. That's what a doctor does. And Jesus was likening himself to that. Hey, there's all these sinners. Yeah, I know. But they need a physician. And I'm the physician that's here to heal them, which is why he was preaching the truth to them when they came and sat down. He wasn't just building relationships to tell them way later on. Years down the road, maybe they'll ask me for a cure. No, they want the cure right now. You don't have to audibly come out and say it. Everybody needs that cure. Every lost person needs Jesus Christ. Amen. And think about this. When the physician is done with his job, what does he do? He goes back home to his family and his friends. That's what a physician does. He's working. He's seeing all these random sick people. Right? They're coming to him. He's treating them. And then he goes home to, with his family and his friends. He has his life outside of that where he spends with his close group of people. Jesus spent most of his time with his disciples. You find, you read the book, read the, read the New Testament, read how Jesus Christ, you know, people gathered under, you know, the multitudes came to hear him preach. They came out into the wilderness. They came where he was. They came to him. The multitudes came out and were listening to him preach. But when, when there weren't the multitudes around, when there weren't all these people, who was Jesus with? His disciples teaching them, training them, spending time with them, doing, you know, spending more of his time with them even than with his own family. That's who he was spending his time with. He was not just making all these random relationships. He made relationships with people that he was discipling. Think about in, uh, you don't have to turn there, but in Acts chapter 8 with Philip, the Bible says in verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Because he saw there's a guy traveling in a chariot. And the Spirit saying, Go, go talk to that guy right there. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Now, Philip wasn't told to go golfing with the Ethiopian eunuch. The Spirit didn't say, Hey, Invite this guy over and start making friendships with him. And then maybe later on you can talk about the Bible with him. What's the first thing you do? Is, hey, you're reading the Bible. Do you understand what you're reading? Well, let me preach to you Jesus Christ. Let me explain that to you. First thing he does. He doesn't ask him about his family and everything else and, and, and do anything like that to make a friendship at all. He goes up to him and he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ unto him under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. God is sending people out to preach the gospel, not to just make a bunch of friends of this world. Here's another excerpt from, from this guy's article. I don't have the whole thing. It's kind of a long article, and there's multiple sermons packed into that one article. 
Here's another expert. He says, I've heard stories of skilled evangelists leading people to instant conversions as they talked on an elevator. Perhaps that happens, but not to me. Again, just showing how unqualified this guy is at all to pastor any church, saying that, you know, and you know what? Yeah, skilled evangelists can lead someone to instant conversion. And he says, he even puts doubt on that, like, perhaps that happens. Like, well, maybe that happens, but not to me. Well, shame on you, yeah. pastor. He says, I find becoming friends takes a lot more energy and commitment than short-term involvement. What does that even mean? Yeah, of course making friends takes a lot more time and energy. But you don't need to make friends with someone in order to lead them to Christ. Right. It takes time to know people, time for them to trust me and think about what I say. Do you think that the people that we go out and we talk to on the door, they don't think about what we say? Are they just like a zombie? Are they just saying, now they may not trust us, okay, but does that mean that they're going to just not think about what we say? Anyone that goes out sewing knows that's not true. Of course they think about what you say. This means doing things socially usually more than once. And then he says, he talks about meeting people. I, I, I guess I didn't put that in here. And he says, for the next eight years, we spent time with them. He finds people, they're lost. For the next eight years, we spend time with them. I mean, they become friends with these people. Just, I mean, over the course of eight years, just going out, doing things socially. Which, I mean, where do you come up with all this time anyways? Just be meeting new people and going out and be like, we don't have time to spend with our friends, the few friends that we do have, like through church and stuff, just in general anyways, let alone going out and just meeting new people and, and just going and doing all kinds of social events with all these other people. I don't know where this guy is coming up with this time, but, um, oh, I know, because he's not serving God, because he's not actually going out and soul winning, because he's not actually reading his Bible, because he's not actually doing the things that we are doing. Eight years after we began, they said yes to joining our community Bible study. At first, they sat quietly, but gradually they were drawn in. As we read and discussed scripture, we watched God do his work in them. One night, she said, trusting in Christ for salvation is what makes me a Christian, isn't it? After eight years, and then going to Bible study, the profound statement, trusting in Christ for salvation is what makes me a Christian, isn't it? That's what they got after eight years of time put in. Now, hey, if that person got saved, did, did they get saved? I don't know. I mean, just asking the question, faith in Christ makes me a Christian? Sort of, but not really. I mean, depends on your definition of Christian, right? I think a Christian is someone that follows Christ, someone who's doing like Christ, and that's not what makes you saved. That's being more of a disciple of Christ. Putting your faith in Christ is what saves you. Trusting in Christ for salvation alone is what saves you. But that's someone asking a question. If someone asks me that, if I'm preaching the gospel to someone and they just ask me that question, am I just going to assume that they're saved? No, because they're not. I could be teaching them about Christ and they say, so, so you're, what you're telling me, because I've heard this before, so what you're telling me is that all I have to do is put my faith in Jesus Christ and I'm saved? Yeah. That's what I'm telling you. Now, do you believe that? Are you going to call on the Lord and get saved? Right. So this person, you know, his, this, and this is his best example in this whole article. I mean, this is like, like the, the best thing that he has. Eight years of someone just getting to understand maybe that they came to the knowledge of salvation. I don't know. I mean, I don't trust it from this guy after everything that I've read. I mean, this guy's probably not even saved himself. But I don't know that. Coming to the knowledge of the truth is not the same as accepting it. And, that's, and this is what he has. And it took him eight years. It takes us eight minutes to bring this knowledge to people. You don't have to make these long-term friends in order for this to work. It works. And just because this guy, well, it's never happened to me. Yeah, it's because you're not doing it right. at all. 
And if you are, you're not doing it right, that's for sure, because the gospel still works. The gospel still saves. And we have people in this room that were saved from door-to-door -door evangelism, from going out and, and preaching the gospel and explaining it to them. Now, the lifestyle evangelism approach to winning the lost, it's really just designed to make you feel good about yourself without actually doing anything. That's, right. that's all it is. And that's why the churches teach it and preach it, because... They care about the money. They want the people still coming in. And they preach the powder puff sermons every week, letting you know how great you are. And when you could spin something in such a way as to say, oh, yeah. You know, because people are going to be thinking, anybody who's saved, anyone who reads their Bible is going to be looking at the Bible saying, I know I should be doing more. There's something missing. And I knew that there was something missing. I knew before I got plugged into a good church. I knew even when I got plugged into church and soul winning wasn't even preached on yet. I knew I, needed to be, I knew I needed to be doing soul winning just for my own personal Bible reading. I knew it. But if I sat in a church and I hear someone saying, well, see, here's the thing. You live this really good life. You focus on yourself. You focus on living this great Christian life. And then, see, this is how you do it. Then other people will see that. And when they ask you about it, then you tell them about Christ. And that's going to work way better. And if you got someone up there teaching that, you're going to be thinking, oh, okay. Here's how I can justify not going out and preaching the gospel because I will preach the gospel when they come to me. So I'm going to make sure that I'm Mr. Happy and Bubbly and, and, and make people want to ask me about it. Because let's face it, when someone asks you about Christ, that doesn't take much boldness to respond to them about it. The boldness is required to actually go out and preach the gospel to them that are not seeking you. Right. That's where, the, where the, the effort comes in. And they want it to be this effortless, you know, no work involved type of soul winning where you're basically just feeling good about yourself for not going out and preaching the gospel. But the part that angered me more than anything else in this article and what angers me just about this doctrine is that they attack real soul winning. It's not good enough for them just to say, well, this is how we're doing it. You know, and you notice earlier when he says, well, perhaps that happens, already casting doubt on the fact that preaching the gospel to someone can actually get them saved and, and doubting that. His article continues. It says, we hired a young woman to help my wife with housework. I mean, who is this guy like? He's got servants. He's going out and playing golf. He's going out to eat. You're like, it's the life of some of these pastors. Looking at other people like, they're unchurched. Do they want, do they want friends too? You know, it's like he lives in a bubble, in this, in this rich fantasy bubble. I don't know what's going on there. But anyway, so they hired a young woman to help my wife with housework. Her family was broken and she was lonely. She had a terrible dysfunctional family. Half the time this woman was said to be cleaning our house was spent talking to my wife. We discovered she was studying different religions to see what she would believe. We jumped at the opportunity. She attended a Bible study with my wife for a year. Keep that in mind, for a year. This woman's, not only, not only is this woman cleaning the house, but half that time is just spent chatting with the wife. For a year, she's coming to their Bible study. I had some long discussions with her about the gospel. She seemed so open, but at the end of that time, she became a Mormon. Okay, after a year of Bible study, him specifically, the pastor talking to her and the pastor's wife talking to her all this time, and that's a lot of time to be talking to someone. She became a Mormon. He says, we were distraught. One Saturday, we brought in a cult specialist to talk with her, because that's what she needs instead of the gospel. Right, so he brings in a cult specialist. There at our kitchen table, he grilled her, but she remained in her newfound faith. Heartbroken, listen to this. We discovered her reason for choosing Mormonism was their sense of family. She didn't understand most of their theology, but she knew they loved her. Our approach of assaulting her with truth was wrong. We should have taken her into our home to get her out of a bad family. That's his answer. Our approach of assaulting her with truth. As if telling somebody the truth is a bad thing. That's what he just said. 
It's a bad thing that we decided to actually tell her the truth. Yeah, mister, let's lie to people and then we'll get that many more people in our church because that's all he really cares about anyways. It's not her soul. It's not telling her the truth. It's getting her to sit down in his stupid church and pay him some more money. That's what he cares about. When you care about someone's soul, you tell them the truth. Amen. When you care about a person, you don't lie to them. You say, thus saith the Lord. This is what Jesus did for you. Now look, it's up to them to take it or leave it. And there's two things, two points about this stupid story and what makes me so angry about this. First of all, Mr. F you know, Mr. Not a Fisher of Men, Mr. Wanting to Go, I'm a pastor and I'm not a Fisher of Men, probably isn't even saved himself. He definitely does not know how to lead someone to the Lord. When you've got a year to continually talk to someone who's even going to Bible studies, they're not opposed to hearing what you have to say. When you've got a year to give somebody the gospel and you don't give them saved, either the problem's with you or that person just isn't getting saved. And I'm going, at least in this case, this guy didn't know, he admittedly didn't know what he was doing anyways with leading people to Christ. Yet he's still trying to teach everyone in this article. So the fact that he attempted and failed isn't a big surprise. So I'm not going to use his failure to say, oh, the approach is all wrong. Because the guy didn't know what he was doing to begin with. But second, just because you try to preach the gospel to someone and they reject it and go and join a cult does not mean that they would have accepted it if only it were presented differently, if only we had invited her into our house, or if only we did these other things. Look, when you give somebody the gospel, it's up to them to decide if they believe it or not. You can't save everyone. We may want to try to, and it may be sad when people choose not to, but all you can do is present the truth unto them. Present the truth unto them. Not withhold the truth. Assault them with the truth. Yes. Continually give them the Bible and God's Word. That's what we need to do. This is what God says. If you love that person, you're going to tell them the truth and not lie to them. That's what you need to do. You can't save everyone, though. And you can't just say, oh, wow, well, this person just completely went off the deep end and joined some other cult. After I told them the truth, oh, well, then my method must be wrong. No. People make decisions. People do stupid things. People don't want... A lot, you know, a lot of people, they hear the gospel and they don't like it. A lot of people can understand the truth. They can hear it. They can say, wow, so you mean that all I have to do is put my faith in Christ? No, I think we actually have to do more than that. And people will say that and they believe that and they don't want to believe that getting saved is as easy as receiving a free gift. They don't want to believe it. So should we just say, oh, well, you don't want to believe that? Then I just won't tell you that. I'll just be nice to you. And then maybe you'll start attending my church. If people don't want to believe it, they're never going to believe it. I mean, it's, it's going to be up to them to change what they believe. Right. We don't cater to those people. We just tell them the truth with love. The reasons why this lifestyle evangelism is such a failure are, one, it's not found in Scripture anywhere. Does the Bible tell you just to go and make friends with people in order to preach them the gospel? You preach them the gospel, and that's what you do. There's no clear gospel presentation, because all it is is just people looking at your lifestyle. And it relies on compromise and not faithfulness to God. Because that's what they're doing. I mean, here's the compromise. He, he used this one example of a person to just say, well, we shouldn't be telling them the truth. You got to compromise all of your core beliefs just to try to get people saved through your lifestyle. A couple examples from the rest of the article. So he said, one night when we took a couple out for a birthday, it meant paying for the drink he ordered. The reason why he brings that up is because he's admitting compromising his beliefs. He obviously believed that drinking alcohol was wrong, but he's say, so he's saying that, well, one of the things that we had to do was when we went out is paying for this guy's alcohol. And as if that's a righteous thing for him to be doing. He also said, in the coming months, I had many religious discussions with them, talking about another couple who were, who were living together in fornication. And he says, never once did we talk about their immorality. Never once. 
in the coming mo in months, right? Months and months spent with these people. Never once did we talk about their immorality. We loved them as they were and told them about Jesus. Now look, again, we don't just go and start railing on people for their sinful lives, you know, that are unsaved, out in this world. We don't just throw all of their sins in their face. But we preach them the gospel. We let them know they need to understand that they're sinners and they need Jesus Christ for salvation. But if you're spending months with people, I mean, if you're really spending time, and I'm not even saying that spending time with someone who's not saved is wrong when your goal is trying to get them saved, but you need to be trying to get them saved, not just becoming close friends with them. Because what's going to happen when you make friendships with somebody? How, how easy is it going to be for you then just to say, you know what, you obviously don't care about the things of God at all, so I'm going to break this friendship with you after you've already established this friendship. But see, why are you establishing the friendship knowing going into that? They don't want anything to do with God. Your friends influence you. My friends, they do. And the group of friends we have here influence you in a positive way, and I'm thankful for that. You know, we encourage each other and edify each other. But when you're spending time with people, they rub off on you. You say, yeah, but I'm going to rub off on them. Yeah, but they're going to rub off on you. Right. You, may, you may rub off on them a little bit and help them out a little bit, but they're going to bring you down a little bit. And when you go out and your goal is to just start making friends with the people of the world, you know what? You're going to be brought down real fast. You start off buying the drink. The next thing you're going to be doing is having a beer with them. And you start compromising and compromising and compromising your belief. Do you think that's, that makes God proud? Do you think that makes God happy of what you're doing? Do you think that, that God's going to bless what you're doing of saying, you know what, yeah, go ahead and just forget all of my law, all my commandment, and just do whatever it takes just to try to lead someone to Christ. Who, who's going to want to listen to you? Oh, you're just like the world, or you're just like everybody else? And see, that's, that's where the whole thing turns on its head. You're supposed to be so much different and so happy and stuff, yet you're doing everything that the world does. See, a true... <laughs> if these people were actually living a godly life, people aren't going to be looking at your lifestyle saying, oh, I want that. When you actually start living by like God's commandments... In God's laws of your life, you're going to look weird. You're going to look different than everybody else. Yeah, you're going to stand out. You're definitely going to be different. And people will take notice of that. But it's probably not going to be because they want to do what you're doing. Now, it is a good opportunity if people ask you, why do you believe, you know, why, why, why do you women always, you know, come to church wearing skirts and dresses? Why, why do you, you know, why do you guys not have a television here? Why do you, you know, whatever the things are, whatever these reasons are, why do you do this? Great opportunities to preach the gospel to people like that. Sure. But it's not going to be because they want to be like that to begin with. Because the things of God are foolishness unto the world. They're going to look at that and be like, you're stupid. Like, I, you know, you're weird. You're, you're, you're a fanatic. But when you preach them, you know, if they ask about it, great. Preach them the gospel. And hopefully they get saved. And then, you know, because a natural man receiveth not the things of God. But when they get the spirit inside of them, then they can, they can start to understand those truths. And you can start to disciple them. Turn, if you would, to Titus chapter 2. We're almost on Titus chapter 2. We're going to see how someone living a righteous and godly life actually looks like according to Scripture. Titus chapter 2. Because a lifestyle evangelism, people don't even know what righteous living looks like. They'll, they'll probably call it Pharisee living when they're the Pharisees. You know, the ones that say and do not. Titus chapter 2. Look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What does that mean? Obeying God's commandments, you know, looking at God's laws, being sober, not getting involved in the lusts of this world and the sin, sinful flesh of this world. 
the, the, you know, but living righteously, living godly, verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Zealous of good works. People wanting to do good and getting the sin out of their life. That's what a, a godly, biblical, righteous lifestyle is going to look like. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So what about the person who's looking at your life and you're trying to win them over by your lifestyle and maybe you're suffering persecution? Is that going to win them over to, your, to, to, to want to be like you? No. But if you're living godly, you know, the persecution is going to come. I'm not saying it's always going to come, but you have to keep this in mind. If this is your means and your method of, of soul winning is, well, they're just going to look at my life and how great it is, and they're going to want to be like me, well, if you're living godly, then that's not going to be the best way to reach people. Right. That is not going to be the primary approach to your soul winning because think about what if there's protesters outside of the church that you attend because you're standing from the word of God and the world hates that. And you've got a bunch of people protesting. Are people going to look at you and say, wow, I want to go to a church where there's a bunch of people screaming and yelling at me and I'm getting on the news and you know, people are, are hanging signs up and, and all this other stuff. That's what I want. Nobody wants that. Nobody, no one's going to look at that and say, a no a lost person especially is going to say, oh, I want what you have. I want the hatred of this world. I want the persecution. You're not going to want that. But if you're doing what's right and godly, those times are going to happen. So when those times come, you know, how good is your lifestyle evangelism really going to be working? John 12, 32 and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. As Jesus Christ speaking, it says, This he said, signifying what death he should die. Jesus Christ wasn't doing lifestyle evangelism in the way that these people think either. He was hated and murdered and killed and nailed to a cross, being brought to an open shame. Do people look at his lifestyle and say, I want that? I want to go wander about in the desert. I want to not get sleep. I want to get nailed to a cross. That's what I want. If you're living like Christ, that's what's going to happen, though. I want no place to, to hang my head. I want no home. I want to go out and just be work, work, work all the time and not ever caring about myself and only caring about other people and God. That's the life of Jesus, my friends. Here's what lifestyle evangelism should be. So I'm going to preach, you know what? Lifestyle evangelism, we're going to practice that in this church. But not the way that they teach it. Not the way that they define it. Not the way that, that they talk about it. Lifestyle evangelism, I'm going to say, is being an evangelist every day. Making it a part of your life. Preaching the gospel to people, opening up your mouth boldly and preaching God's word and giving them the gospel should be part of your regular life. So yes, the real estate agent, yes, the, the grocer at the store, yes, whoever you come in contact with, make it a part of your life to preach the gospel to those people. That is the lifestyle evangelism that we ought to have. It's not waiting for people to come to us. It's going to them at every opportunity we have, not even just at the soul winning times, but at every opportunity that you have. That is the lifestyle evangelism that we need to be, we need to have. Jo uh, Luke chapter 14, I'm going to read a couple verses for you, just some great soul winning um, references and then we're and then we're going to call it good here because let's get the bible's approach to evangelism i don't care what these what these modern methods are i don't care what these these people who get no results are teaching because the guy's getting no results i mean let's face it when it takes you eight years for somebody to come to the knowledge of salvation being by faith your method stinks yeah. if that's all you're getting that's not, that's, that's not the method we see in the book of Acts. You know, when 3,000 get saved at one, in one day. Luke 14, verse 16, Then he said unto them, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray that you have me excused. 
And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Now, it says, So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the, and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. The commandment here is go out. Go out into the streets. Go out into the highways and hedges. Go out and compel them to come in. Go out and persuade them and talk to them, give them the truth, and try to explain why they need to come in. God wants his house filled. He wants as many people saved as possible. And you know what he didn't say here about all these people? Well, we've got all these other things to do. He didn't say, oh, well, that's fine because we're buddies and we're just going to keep on you know, for years and years and years to come. Maybe one of these days you'll come to my supper. That's not what he said. He's saying, no, go out and get them now. My supper's happening now. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says in, um, in 2 Corinthians 6, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted in the day of salvation. I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We need to be treating the people we come in contact with as if today is their last day because it might very well be we don't know. Oh, well, this person's young. It doesn't matter. Young people die all the time. Today is the day of salvation. You don't have to go out, and you shouldn't be just going out before you preach the gospel to someone and saying, you know what, I'm just going to make friends with them. I'm going to win their trust. I'm going to do all this stuff before I ever bring up the Bible to them. It's nonsense. Today is the day of salvation. They need to hear it from the start. Now look, if you're working on somebody and, and they don't get saved right away, you can continue to work with them. You can take them out to eat. There's nothing wrong with going out to eat with an unsaved person, especially when you're going to go preach the gospel to them. But what I'm saying is we don't just go and make friends with them, bring them into our house, bring them into our family, bring them into our close circle, and they're not saved, and especially when you're not even preaching the gospel to them just because you want to get that one right opportunity. That is wrong. If you love, and that just shows your lack of love, if you love somebody, if you really do care about them, you're going to care way more about preaching the truth unto them and them hearing it and having an opportunity. Maybe today they'll, pre they'll, they'll get saved. Instead of waiting eight years. I mean, how would you feel if someone knew, if, if someone got to know you? Put yourself in those shoes. You're unsaved. You meet someone. You meet the pastor of the church. You meet that person, you become friends with that person. You do all kinds of things together. And eight years later, he finally, because you said something, told you the truth, told you the gospel, and then you get saved. When maybe that whole time you wanted to know, which is why you ever even wanted to become friends with him in the first place, is because you wanted to know. But you didn't, you didn't have the courage to ask, maybe. Eight years of your life of not being saved because this fool thinks, oh, well, I just got to earn your trust and, and, and build a relationship with you before I could ever open up my mouth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's wicked. Yes, I said that's wicked. You say, oh, but he's still trying to win souls. It's completely wrong. It's, it's not the way to do it. You go out and preach the gospel to him right away. Amen. You give people that opportunity right away. And I could go on and on. There's so, there's so much that we need to do. You know, in 1 Corinthians 9.16, it says, uh, the Apostle Paul is writing, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid unto me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He's saying, this is my job. This is my duty. I need to be going out and preaching the gospel. Nowhere in the Scripture you're going to find going out and making friends before you can preach it. Nowhere in the Scripture you're going to find, I needed to find people that liked me, f f step number one, before I preach the gospel to that person. That is false. And anyone who believes that way needs to get right with God and needs to get some boldness, get in a good church, and you know what? Maybe you don't know how to go soul winning. You need to learn. 
Go learn from people who are actually doing it and getting results and going out and preaching the gospel. And, and, and you know what? There's plenty of, of now information on, online. There's plenty of soul winning demos that you can watch from great churches. And the bottom line is, look at the Bible yourself. You know what? If all you know is John 3.16, use John 3.16 to explain salvation to somebody. But get started doing it. Today is the day. There is an urgency to this message. It is not something you just put off on the back burner and wait. We never know what a day is going to bring. Our life is like a vapor. It's there for a second and it's gone. There are people, and, and, and hopefully you don't have to learn this the hard way, although most of us do, that are family members or friends, and it's just, they die and it's a shock. And you're like, wow. You don't want to have the regret of saying, man, I wish I would have preached the gospel to that person because they didn't believe. I had a close personal friend of mine die earlier this year. Praise God that I didn't withhold preaching the gospel from him because he was saved. And even after the first time, you know what, even after the first time, I thought he got saved once. I preached the gospel to him. He didn't quite receive it, but then later he told me on the phone, he's like, yeah, you know what, I did pray. I did, you know. So I was like, cool, he got saved. But I didn't let it stop there. And, and thank God I didn't. Because, why? Because I talked about the Bible some more with him. I I just, be, why? Because it's the things that I think about anyways, the things that I'm interested in. And I, and I brought it up to him again because I, you know, I was thinking about him getting baptized. And I found out then he still isn't saved. So I preached the gospel unto him again, and then he got saved. We can't shy away. You can't wait and say, oh, man. And you know what? Because then he died. If I would have waited and said, you know what? Maybe things aren't right yet. And he, you know, I'll wait for him to move out here because he was living in Chicago at the time. He got, he got saved and baptized before he ever moved out here. I could have said, well, I'll just wait because he's planning on moving out. I'll wait till he gets here, and then we can start hanging out more together, and we can start doing more things, and I can build a better relationship with him. You know, no. He needed to hear it immediately. Just like everybody that's unsaved today needs to hear it immediately. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great uh, instructions that you have for us, dear Lord, on, on winning souls and going out and preaching the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would please help us. And there's so many churches around us, even in this area, that that I believe would subscribe to this lifestyle evangelism. Lord, I pray that you please help us to reach the people in those churches so that, especially if they're saved, dear Lord, to be able to recognize that that's not right and that that's, that's a problem, that they need to get into this church where we could teach them and train them to go out and win souls to, for you, dear Lord. We pray that you would please just help us to do our job as, to the best of our ability and that you would empower us to go out this afternoon and, uh, and bring people to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.